um, from the from the nebula. That's my guess as to what's going on. Okay, back to this. So, same disclaimer. Most of this stuff is from memory, um, and we're going to be talking about axions. And so, there may be some mistakes in the details, um, but for the most part, this is the way that things are going on these two experiments. We're going to be looking specifically at two different experiments. Uh, I mentioned before axion uh, constraints that the experiments that we talked about last time were constraints from light shining through wall type results. So let me see if we can find. Uh, okay, so here is we'll we'll steal this one. View image. Okay, so they have a bunch of experiments that are done at particle accelerators. That's the ones that are up here. Um, there's constraints on axions. So again, this is the math, the coupling of the axion to the photon. This is the mass of the axion. We don't know uh, where we don't know what the properties of the axion are if it exists at all. We do know if the axion exists and it happens to be the axion that addresses the problem of the lack of CP violation in the strong nuclear force interactions, then the axion must have properties that land in this band right here. So that band is where most people are interested in searching because if there were an axion, there's extra motivation for it to live in this part of parameter space because the lack of strong CP violation, the lack of CP violation in the strong nuclear force is an issue that physicists uh, really need to contend with. Um, yes, for every axion, there's an equal and opposite reaxion. Uh, so those axions would live in this band. And so that, anyways, that's the target that a lot of people shoot for, is to constrain the axion in this region. Um, however, axion-like particles, not necessarily the QCD axion, but other ac axions that behave the same but don't address the strong CP problem can live anywhere. They can have any kind of coupling. And so when you place a constraint from whatever kind of experiment you have, you will exclude axions with certain couplings and certain masses. All right, so anyways, most of these things up here are um, experiments that run from particle colliders. If you go to even higher masses, there are other constraints from particle colliders on the QCD axion. You can see that Supernova 1987A prevents um, prevented axions. Uh, the way that that works in terms of the supernova is that if you can produce axions, then that's a way of losing energy. And so when you have a supernova explosion, you give off a certain amount of light. You also give off a certain amount of neutrinos. You give off certain uh, types of particles, like all sorts of things are going to be happening in that explosion. And all of those different forms of energy are going to be removing energy from the, um, the explosion itself. And so when you make an observation of a supernova, both in the optical or in the case of uh, supernova 1987A, the neutrinos that came from the supernova explosion those two things combined place constraints on what other forms of energy can be produced inside the core. Because axions couple so weakly to matter, when you have a nuclear explosion, when you have a supernova explosion, if the axions are able to leak out, then that actually will affect the nature of the explosion itself. Let me draw a picture of what such a problem would be, or like what kind of problem would arise under those circumstances. So let's suppose that here is, um, here's a star, and it's going to explode. So you have all these stuff trying to get out. So here's all these particles um, trying to get out from the star as the star is exploding. And so it's driving this explosion to take place. Um, it turns out from our understanding of um, supernova explosions, as we try to model supernova explosions in a computer, we see that um, the neutrinos that are produced are important for driving the explosion process. That the neutrinos, it's super dense down here, so when you form neutrinos, they exert a pressure in the core, and that pressure helps drive the expansion of the, the supernova explosion. So if you had another form of energy to release from the core, so if you could convert some of the energy into axions, actually these axion particles, they couple even more weakly than neutrinos do, and as a consequence, they would stream out, they would take energy out of the core, um, and could even prevent the formation of a supernova explosion. So if you produce a lot of axions in a supernova explosion, all the energy leaks out, then you don't get a supernova explosion because you're, you don't have enough energy to drive the explosion process. So you can place constraints on the properties of axions based upon the fact that stars actually explode. Um, so in terms of the speed that the axions move, uh, it actually depends on their mass. So if you have a massive axion like up here, this is, 10 to the 6, so that's a capital MEV. So this is uh, an axion that has a similar mass. If an axion is up here, it has a similar mass to, uh, what was I going to say, what kind of particles? So this is like muons. 
which are pretty massive. Uh, a particle, an axion with a mass of like three on this plot, like in this area, that would have the mass of an electron. Um, and so the speed with which the axion moves actually depends upon the mass. The more massive they are, the slower they would move. The less massive they are, they would become increasingly relativistic and eventually would behave like neutrinos. Um, okay, so that's what's going on with this supernova 1980, 1987 thing. This horizontal branch stars is the same idea. Horizontal branch stars go through pulsation. Um, and if you have a source of energy that um, where the star can lose energy through instead of through radiation or instead of through producing particles uh, like neutrinos, it can lose energy through the production of axions and that would affect the pulsation properties of horizontal branch stars. Uh, basically what happens with horizontal branch stars is you have, um, so I apologize for the airplanes flying over. When the wind blows from a given direction, then the airplanes have to take off um, directly over my office. So that's, uh, you know, that's the nature of uh, where I'm streaming. Not much that can be done about it. Okay, so you have, um, at least not much can be done about it with my current infrastructure for streaming. Um, maybe I'll, at some point, maybe I'll get a microphone that like points directly into my mouth so that you can only hear me, but we're not there yet. So uh, you have a layer with a horizontal branch star, you'll have a layer in the star where when it's in the, when it's deep in the interior, it gets really hot and that ionizes and it actually makes it so that the photons coming from the core reflect off of that ionized layer and it exerts a pressure on that layer. So the layer starts to expand and as the layer expands, it cools and then it deionizes. Like the electrons recombine with the <clears throat> with the with the atoms, and then it becomes more transparent. And so it gets up here, it cools off to the point where it goes through the reverse transition, the electrons recombine, and now all the photons can escape, and now there's no more pressure. And so that layer shrinks sinks back down, sinks back down towards the core of the star. When it sinks back down, it heats up again, it heats up, it reionizes, and so it builds up the pressure from the photons again as they try to get out. That drives that layer back out. And so you get this pulsation from the stripping an electron off and then it recombines and then it strips it off again that recombines as the layer expands in and out and heats heats up and cools off. So if you add axions to the mix, so now you have a source of energy that you can um, have escape the star and that's going to change the properties of the pulsation of the star. So that's where that um, result comes from. This cast experiment, that's what we're going to be talking about today, so I won't talk about that. Uh, not, well, not right now. This LSW, that's light shining through wall experiment, that's what we talked about before. When you're, you shine a laser beam in in a magnetic field, you produce axions and then they recombine before light comes out the other end, a photomultiplier tube. Um, so these are results that come from those laser experiments. There are some issues. Um, so this is uh, more constraints from supernova 1987A. This is the gamma burst that comes from supernova 1987A, like the gamma rays that came out. Um, and this gamma transparency. So this issue is interesting. So here's the problem. Uh, I believe that this is an issue that comes from TeV energy gamma rays. So TeV is tera electron volts. What does that mean? So we've got uh, we've got uh, me. Okay, we've got electron volts. Uh, electron volts. That is the energy that an electron have has as it travels one volt. Um, across one volt of electric potential. It's a very, very, very small amount of energy. And you take that and you divide it by C squared, EV over C squared, and that gets you a mass, right? So you use Einstein's equation to do that. So this is the unit of energy slash mass that high energy physicists use. Um, you can see it in this, in this graph um, that it's given the mass of the axion in electron volts, and it's actually electron volts per C squared. Um, the important number to remember is that uh, a proton is 10 to the 9 electron volts. So that's right here. That's 1 GeV. Okay, so back to this transparency, the gamma ray transparency. <clears throat> uh, electron volts. Um, the electron is 511 kilo electron volts. So it's 500,000 of these. Or you can think of it as basically just 1 capital MeV. Um, it squiggles 1 capital MeV. It's only a factor of 2 off. So electrons are around 1 capital MeV. That's a mega electron volt, a million. Um, a thousand times more massive than that is one GeV, so that's a proton. So a proton is 2,000 times more massive than an electron. Um, so that goes you from takes you from an MeV to a GeV. And then uh, you have a TeV, which is next after G. So that's a, um, so this is a billion, is GeV, and then this would be a trillion. So a TeV is, the the tevatron the particle accelerator the tevatron 
that's measured in TeV. So it's taking protons and accelerating them so that their kinetic energy is a thousand times from a billion to a trillion. The kinetic energy of the protons in the Tevatron or in the LHC, the LHC is at like 10 TeV, um, is the kinetic energy is a thousand times bigger than the mass energy um, is what that basically means. Okay, so TeV gamma rays. So these are gamma rays that come off of stellar explosions. They have a trillion electron volts worth of energy. That's a lot of energy. That's a thousand times the energy of a proton. Um, for subatomic particles, that's a lot of energy. Okay, so the TeV gamma rays, what happens is you have an explosion. Um, it could be a blazar. It could be like a black hole in the center of a galaxy that's beaming off these things. It could be a stellar explosion, but you produce TeV gamma rays. The thing with TeV gamma rays is that there's ambient light. So here's like space, space. Here's space, there's ambient light in space from that's being produced by all these stars. And you have a photon coming in and it can interact with the photons, uh, if I'm remembering this correctly, I'm pretty sure this is right. Pretty sure this is right. Uh, you have the cosmic infrared background. So the infrared background is infrared light coming from all of these different stars. And it just exists out in the universe. Um, and the TeV gamma ray comes in and it scatters off of these um, background infrared photons and produces electron-positron pairs. Okay, and now you have an electron-positron pair, which is a particle. They might be going kind of fast, so they're going to give off some kind of radiation because they're accelerating, and you lose energy. So you start off with super high energy in these TeV gamma rays, and you lose energy by scattering, by pair producing off of the cosmic infrared background radiation. And so TeV sources, so distant blazars and stuff like that, the universe should be opaque to those TeV sources. Let me make sure that I'm actually telling you correctly because um, there are two related instances here. One of them is um, inverse Compton scattering and the other one is this pair production. And one of them produces the GZK cutoff and the other one produces the TeV gamma ray cutoff. And I can't remember which is which, so we're gonna solve that right now, just to make sure that I'm telling everybody the truth. So let me look up real quick the GZK, GZK cutoff. This, is, this will be a topic of a different stream, um, just to make sure that I'm getting the right thing. So uh, let me set by slow interaction with protons in the microwave background radiation, right? So this is an interaction with high energy protons uh, I think it's inverse Compton scattering off of the cosmic microwave background radiation, and it produces, so gamma CMB, yeah, okay, so I did it right. So I, I was right the first time. Um, the GZK cutoff is uh, different kinds of particles interacting with a different background, <clears throat> producing a different effect. For the TeV gamma ray, the TeV, tran TeV transparency is, why is the universe transparent to these photons? Because these photons should be producing, should be pair producing off of the cosmic infrared background, and as a consequence, we shouldn't be able to see them at certain distances. You know, maybe the distance where this interaction takes place is, you know, some number of light years. You know, like a thousand light years. It's going to be more than a thousand. Let's say a million light years. Um, a million light years is the distance over which you would expect to lose all these TeV photons. But the fact of the matter is that we see these photons for coming from very, very distant sources. And so that's the question, where do these TeV gamma rays come from? And one of the possibilities is that uh, if you have a distant galaxy, here's a distant galaxy emitting TeV photons in this particular area, the galaxy is gonna have its own magnetic field. So here's the magnetic field of that galaxy. It's emitting these TeV photons and you can do the light shining through wall experiment using galaxies instead of laser beams. So here are the TeV photons. They interact with the magnetic field. These photons um, might produce axions. So now you've got a bunch of axions coming from these distant blazar sources. And the axions um, don't interact with the cosmic infrared background. And so the cosmic infrared background, um, I'm gonna abbreviate CIRB. I don't know if it actually has a name, but that's the one we're gonna use. Um, the cosmic infrared background, the photons can't make it. Right? The photons get absorbed and produce these pairs and and distort, like you don't get the TeV gamma rays anymore, you get lower energy gamma rays. So the photons are stopped by the cosmic infrared background, the axions can make it through, and then on the other side, here is our galaxy, we are the Milky Way galaxy, and there's us, this is us, right there, and we are looking this direction, and the axions make it through the cosmic infrared background, 
uh, like intergalactic space, and they come into the Milky Way galaxy's magnetic field. So here's the Milky Way magnet. Milky Way Galaxy's magnetic field, and they reconvert into photons here, and then we detect them. So in this case, uh, you would have, you do a light shining through a wall experiment over distances of, you know, intercluster distances, which is what, like 300 million light years, um, light shining through wall experiment. So anyways, that is where constraints on this type of interaction from axion-like particles is where this gamma transparency comes from. Um, I believe that these these might be, instead of constraints, these might be the couplings that you need in order for gamma ray transparency to be explained by axion-like particles. So I believe that these are actual signals. So this gamma ray burst 1987A and the gamma transparency, I believe that these are actually signals that have yet to be excluded by experiment. So the CAST experiment um, or like its subsequent iterations, there's one called IAXO. Um, that they might be able to push down here and exclude axions as the explanation for the gamma transparency and the gamma ray bursts. So I believe that these are signals and that future experiments should be able to exclude the axion-like particles as an explanation for the signals that we observe. Okay, so there's stuff here, this white dwarf energy, energy loss. White dwarfs, if they can produce axions, then they will also radiate away, which will cause white dwarfs to cool faster. And if white dwarfs cool faster, then we should see colder white dwarfs than what we currently see. When you look at the temperature of white dwarf stars, that limits the rate that they can cool because we know that white dwarf stars are no older than 13.7 billion years, which is the age of the universe. So the first white dwarf stars that form, they've cooled down to a given temperature which limits the type of radiation that they can give off. So they can give off some particles, they can give off a lot of light. If they can radiate axions, then it will cause them to cool faster because axions would carry away energy. Um, so uh, there's that. Now, there is something that is interesting about axions in the early universe. If the axion exists, then in the early universe, you would expect axions to be produced in copious quantities, the same way that all the other particles are produced. So here's the early universe, and you're producing electron-positron pairs, um, you're producing proton-antiproton pairs, you're producing photons, you're producing um, chi particles, if those even exist, we can pretend that they exist, chi and chi bar particles, you're producing top quarks and anti-top quarks, and uh, muons and anti-muons. All these particles are being produced in essentially equal numbers. Um, there's some asymmetry because of CP violation, which is the whole point that the axion was produced to begin with, um, or thought of to begin with. Um, but you should also produce axion, uh, axions in the early universe. The amount, the number of axions that you produce in the early universe depends upon the mass of the axion. It turns out that the more massive the axion is, the fewer particles you produce. So if we look at this plot, if the axion has a large mass, then you don't produce as much axion, as many axions in the early universe. And as the axion mass gets smaller and smaller and smaller, it turns out that the universe would produce more and more and more of them. So, and it's not linear. It's not like you get twice as small and you get twice the number of axions. You get twice as small and you get two point something times the number of axions. I think it goes I don't remember the details, but it's something like the axion matter density, the axion density that you produce goes as the uh, coupling constant to the 7 eighths power or something like that. No, it's got to be more than one. Um, but it's got, some, it's got some exponent that's not equal to one. That's the important thing. Um, so that the lighter the axion becomes, the more of it you produce. So the omega axion is equal to this, the coupling constant to some power, such that the smaller the axion mass, and as a consequence, the smaller the coupling, the more of them you produce. Probably because like maybe they don't annihilate with other things or something like that. Um, so anyways, that, that's been figured out. So if the axion is lower and lower mass, you produce more and more of it, which means there's more mass in the universe made of axions. And so that's where this Thing comes in this part right here that says CDM so if I zoom right in so when you have micro EV so that's 10 to the minus 6 micro EV scale axions you produce in the early universe the correct abundance of axions to explain the dark matter so in general the QCD dark matter um, or the QCD axion could contribute to the dark matter but it wouldn't necessarily be all of the dark matter however if it has a coupling, if it has a mass down in this range and a coupling in this range, um, then the QCD axion produces the right relic abundance of axions from the early universe to be the dark matter. Like that is the dark matter 
um, candidate, or that would be a primary dark matter candidate, which means that those are axions that are just floating around. They're not axions that are produced in the sun. They're not axions that are produced in laser systems with magnetic fields. These are axions that were produced in the early universe and are just left over. So that's where this CDM, so that's cold dark matter. And so if you were gonna build an experiment instead of trying to produce axions from scratch, if you were gonna do an experiment that was designed to detect axions that the universe produced from scratch-ish, uh, then you would design an axion dark matter experiment. So ADMX, axion dark matter experiment. This is the experiment that is specifically designed to look for this type of axion. So notice that the coupling constant they have to be sensitive to is, this is uh, minus 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. It is five orders of magnitude weaker than what you get from these other astrophysical constraints. And this cast experiment, that's another one that we're gonna look at. So if axions are produced inside the sun, then you would want a axion solar telescope. So this is the CERN axion solar telescope. That's looking for axions that are produced in the sun and it's able to detect QCD axions, uh, just barely, um, but it's not able to detect dark matter axions. Um, we don't know if axions are the dark matter, but if they were, they probably would have a coupling down in this area. Instead, you would want an axion dark matter search. This is looking for axions that are left over from the Big Bang. This one is looking for axions that are produced inside the sun. So we're going to do each of these experiments one at a time, starting with, uh, I guess we're already there, so we're going to start with ADMX. So this is the axion dark matter experiment, a search for axions that are the dark matter halo that the galaxy is embedded in. So if I were to draw a picture of this, it would look like the following. It would be, here is the galaxy halo. This is the dark matter halo. Here is the, the galaxy inside the dark matter halo. Here is us located right here on a star or on a planet orbiting a star that's orbiting the galaxy inside the dark matter halo. This dark matter halo would be made out of axions if the axions are the dark matter and they were produced in the early universe the way that we would expect them to be produced in the early universe. Okay, so how does this work? Well, the axions are already there, so you don't have to make them. All you need to do is detect them. And you're gonna use the same interaction that we saw in the other case, where you have, uh, in this case, you have an axion come in, and you want to interact with, uh, well, axions don't look like that. That looks like a photon to me. Uh, let me go back and say, here's an axion that comes in, and it interacts with a photon from, say, an ambient magnetic field, and that will produce another photon, and this is the one that you detect. So here's a photon coming from a magnetic field, here's the axion coming from space, and this is the photon that is produced because of the scattering of the axion off of the thing here. Now, now you have to build an extremely, extremely sensitive photon detector. How do you detect an extremely sensitive photon detector? And in particular, you want to look at what is the energy that's gonna come from these axions. Notice that the axion mass is 10 to the minus six electron volts. Okay, so 10 to the minus six electron volts, that's an important number. So you're looking at uh, 10 to the minus six EV for the axion mass. The axion is going to be providing most of the energy in this system, and it's going to produce a photon that comes off the back end that is 10 to the minus six electron volts. 10 to the minus six electron volts is basically, uh, let's see, so one micron, uh, one micron, um, uh, one micrometer is, so the wavelength of light that's one micron, that's in the infrared. If you want, and this has basically one electron volt of energy. So one electron volt energy photons is in the infrared. It's one micron, one micrometer. Okay, so now we're looking at 10 to the minus six electron volts, which means it's going to be 10 to the six times bigger, right? Because the shorter the wavelength, the higher the energy. The longer the wavelength, the lower the energy. So let me uh, just go through a brief, because this will be interesting, I promise. Uh, we have one electron volt photons gives us a wavelength of one uh, micron. So that's mu m. So that's 10 to the minus six meters. So one electron volt infrared light, just barely in the infrared, is one micron in length, because visible light is half a micron. Um, green light is 500 nanometers. This is 1,000 nanometers. That's 10 to the minus six meters. Now we're gonna go to the energy that we're looking at is 10 to the minus six, because it's converting the mass of the axion into these, um, converting the mass of the axion into energy. So now we're looking at 
uh, 10 to the minus 6 electron volts, which is going to mean longer wavelength light, longer wavelength radiation, longer wavelength, lower energy. So we go from uh, 10 to the minus 6 meters, uh, the wavelength is going to be a million, this is a million times lower energy, it's going to be a million times longer wavelength. That gives us one meter. So the wavelength of light that's going to be produced by these axions interacting in our apparatus is going to be one meter wavelength. And so what you want to do is build a cavity or build a detector specifically so that one meter wavelength light or you know something that looks like this. So this is one meter wavelength. That's one meter. Um, you're going to design a cavity such that the size of that cavity is basically a half a meter in size, a meter tall, meter wide. You know, that's roughly the dimensions that you're looking for. And it's going to depend upon the mass of the axion. Like we don't know exactly the mass of the axion. So you build an apparatus that's this size such that you can tune it to couple more strongly to different wavelengths. And we can build this. We can build radio frequency cavities. So what you do is you build a very, 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 very high quality radio frequency cavity. So here's an RF cavity. This is basically something where radio, radio wave or radio wavelength light will bounce around back and forth and its waves, that wavelength fits in the cavity, fits perfectly in the cavity. And so you can amplify it. So if you excite it, so you have something come in and it excites the wavelength here, it will add coherently. And so as you add more and more, as more and more photons appear, the wavelength gets um, bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, thank you for that, Ray. I appreciate that very much. Um, dark matter could be any matter like dark matter, neutrino, or anything else. So uh, with now with the dark matter, especially with axion dark matter, dark matter can't be, because it's cold dark matter. That's, that's an important thing. The CDM is cold dark matter, which means that um, the... Uh, they cannot be moving very quickly. They have to be moving very slowly. Because if you have dark matter that's moving very quickly, then you don't form the halo. The dark matter has to be moving slowly so that the halo can, the, they're not moving so fast that the halos dissipate. The halos have to stay bound together, which means that the particles need to be moving more slowly, which means that you can't have neutrinos. Neutrinos move too fast, and so you can't form dark matter halos with neutrinos. Um, that would be called warm dark matter or hot dark matter. Um, incidentally, this thing says the gap on it. Um, that's a gap between basically what we can constrain um, with astrophysics and what we can constrain from these ADMX searches. This is a gap in axion. Uh, th this is an interesting region to look for axions um, that is difficult to constrain because it's a different type of experiment that we haven't built yet. Uh, one thing that I, I should point out, and I probably should have pointed it out earlier, but um, it is what it is and I'm going to do it now, um, and that is that because you produce more axions, the smaller the mass is, there aren't many searches looking for axions down here. There aren't many searches looking for axions that are like nano EV. The reason is that you produce too many axions in the early universe, and eventually the axion mass gets so small that when you produce all the axions, the whole universe just collapses in on itself because of gravity. And so there's, there's not compelling reason to look for nano EV axions. Um, now, there are some ways around that, but uh, we're not talking about those ways right now. There are reasons not to look for nano EV axions because if there are nano EV axions, then we're already dead, right? The universe would have already collapsed. We would never have been around here to ask the questions about what caused the strong CP force to not have, um, or the strong force to not have CP violation. So this overcloses the universe. And so that's why they have a lower bound down here is that the predictions are axions with lower mass than this overclose the universe. We would already be dead. And so we just start looking at this length and go, um, uh, we span a few decades in mass here to look for axions that are the dark matter. Okay, so anyways, you build this RF cavity and it's a very high quality RF cavity so that any small excitation gets amplified by the resonance of the cavity. And the size of this cavity is gonna be something on the order of one meter because that is the wavelength of light that you get with a micro EV photon. Now, you can't, this would only be, because this cavity is only sensitive, uh, is, is extremely high quality, it means that it's sensitive to very, very narrow uh, energies, um, a spectrum of energies that can excite it. So th what this looks like is if you look at the response, response as a function of, let's say frequency, frequency, with a high quality cavity, a low quality cavity is gonna have a response that looks kind of like this. 
So it'll resonate kind of it, if you drive it really, 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 really slowly. So extremely low frequencies, then the cavity, the electric field and the cavity will go up and down. So the electric field is what when you excite a radio frequency cavity, you're exciting a photon in there. And that photon has an electric field. So this is you're responding to the electric field of um, the electromagnetic field that's oscillating in there. You can detect the electric field. So really, really low frequency, you get some response and then it, it might resonate. Um, and then if you go to super duper high frequency, then there's no response at all. The cavity has too much um, inertia. Um, it takes too long for the cavity to respond and this thing is wiggling around super fast. And so there's basically no response. Okay, as the quality of the cavity increases, this shape distorts like this. It gets more narrow and the sensitivity, the response goes way up. But you, the trade-off is that the more response you want to get, the higher the quality of the response, the more narrow the wavelength range is that will excite that response. And so if you go to super duper duper high frequency cavity or high quality cavities, then you get a curve that looks basically like that. You get an extremely narrow line. The width of this narrow line is related to the quality factor. The height is basically proportional to the quality factor. The width is basically proportional to one over the quality factor so that when you multiply them together, you get one. So it's the same total response from any of these cavities, but um, the more, the higher the quality factor, the larger the response is, but the more narrow the response is. So when you have a cavity that's designed to detect these axions that are coming from space and exciting your thing, you want to have a huge response. You need to have a huge response because you have to be sensitive five orders of magnitude away from what you can get from laser experiments. Um, so you need to have an enormous response, but that means you're only sensitive to an extremely narrow band of wavelengths, extremely narrow band of energies. So what ADMX has to do, what this experiment has to do, is if you look inside the bore of the RF cavity, it's going to have a rod in there. It's a metal rod, and they can move this rod around to make it move this rod around. That's an arrow uh, to make it so that it responds to different wavelengths. You can fit different wavelengths into that cavity. Um, again, with a very narrow response. And what they will do is they will slowly scan through frequencies. So they'll stay here, they'll park here. They have, they're sensitive to a very, very narrow band of axion masses. They'll wait for 90 seconds, I think is their integration time. It's a really short integration time because they're so sensitive. Um, and if they don't see something, then they shift it ever so slightly. They shift it by like a part per million because the cavity quality factor is about a million, something like that. So they shift it a tiny amount that adjusts so here's where they were sensitive with one uh, in one position then they shifted a tiny amount so that they're sensitive here in the next position that was bad and then they basically fill in um, by moving this tuning rod around they fill in the allowed um, axion mass range so let's take a look at what it looks like in the interior of the ADMX magnet so we'll pull this up we'll go to ADMX experiment. So this experiment was first built at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory uh, in Livermore, California, kind of by Davis and in between Sacramento and the Bay Area. And then it was moved. Um, my last year of graduate school, it was moved from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory up to the University of Washington. Uh, and that's where I went to graduate school. So I was there when they were doing the interviews to bring um, the leader of this experiment up to the University of Washington to run it up there. Basically, it's a bit cheaper to run it at a university. You don't need the full National Lab infrastructure. Um, and so now it's at the University of Washington, um, where it was originally built at uh, whatever that other place is called, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Uh, so now this was, the idea behind this was Pierre Sakivi. He's the guy that we saw before. He's at the University of Florida. Um, anyway, so they did an early experiment um, and then uh, and then it went on to make this ADMX one. They did an early experiment in Florida, and then the Lawrence Livermore National Lab did kind of a beefed up version that they then sent to the University of Washington. So this is what the cavity looks like. Um, now, it's important that cavity, this cavity has to be in a magnetic field because remember that the axion coupling looks like this. So axion comes in, it has to couple to some photon. You have to supply this photon, supply. And then you get the signal, this is the signal. Okay, so this is an RF photon that you need to capture inside your cavity, but you need to supply the photons to begin with, and that's supplied by a magnetic field. 
So this is the RF cavity. They have these probes up here to measure fluctuations in the electromagnetic field that come from the axions when they do that. Um, it has a, is it like a one Tesla magnet? Is it one or a couple Tesla magnet? Um, that's a huge magnetic field, but, um, but that is uh, where this, but they, but they have a magnetic field to supply the photons to couple it to. So a uh, question came up, uh, what are axions? Axions are hypothetical particles that could be the dark matter. Um, they were first hypothesized to explain um, some of the interaction or the lack of certain interactions with the strong nuclear force. So strong nuclear force was expected to have some kind of interactions. They weren't seen. The axion was invented as a way to remove that discrepancy between the prediction and what was observed. Um, and they could be a dark matter particle if they have the right kind of properties. And so this experiment is specifically going on the assumption if the dark matters are real and they are, um, if the axion are, is real and it's the dark matter, then we should be able to see it in this detector. So that's a, a brief overview of what axions are. Okay, so this is um, the experiment. Uh, when it's running, they actually, okay, so I've seen at the ADMX running. Um, it was at, uh, I was at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and the magnetic field is basically threading through this. It's a solenoid magnetic field. So the magnetic field, what they do is uh, they have the RF cavity like this. Oh, that's kind of ugly. I missed. Okay, they have the RF cavity like that. And then the magnetic field goes through it. They have like a big solenoid here and it drives the magnetic field like that. So you have like a North Pole and a South Pole with the RF cavity stuck here in the middle. Well, and so what you could do is you could basically just put a bunch of wrenches and screwdrivers and hammers and things like that coming off of these magnetic field lines and you could have several tools or several wrenches um, stacked on top of each other, paper clips, whatever, um, threading through or like following the magnetic field lines coming off of the, um, the top of the experiment, um, like the experimental cavity. So that was kind of weird to see like, oh, here's a, here's a wrench and then hooked onto the wrench is another wrench and there's three or four of them and then you, you can put nails and pencils and stuff like that sticking off the side because the magnetic field is particularly strong certainly strong by everyday standards. It's not necessarily strong by particle accelerator standards or medical imaging standards, but it is um, strong by, you know, the kind of magnet that you have in your house um, type thing. Uh, part of this was actually, the thing that made it uh, so that it worked is the receiver in ADMX is a squid, superconducting quantum interference device. So they have to cool it way, way down um, in order to, because it has to be cryogenic. Um, it has to be superconducting. So you have a superconducting ring, and then when there's a change in the magnetic field, um, so these squid devices, uh, as I recall, is a fairly simple thing. You have a, a twisted, where are we going? You have a twisted wire like this, and it forms a loop. And here's the twisted side on the other side. And so it's superconducting, so there's no friction. And then you have, so this is embedded inside your cavity. Uh, of course, it's very, very small. It's a tiny little loop. And then when you excite an electric field inside this cavity, um, that is going to induce a current. Or Okay, so you excite an electric field from the photon that comes in. A photon is both an electric and a magnetic field. Um, the oscillating magnetic field is going to excite a current in this loop because of Lenz's law. And because there's no friction, that is going to, you get an oscillation of the magnetic field without dissipating, without removing any energy from the cavity because there's no friction. And that's gonna get picked up on the other side by regular electronics, amplified, and that produces your signal. So the device itself is uh, fairly simple, um, but it's the you know it's superconducting and it relies on really straightforward physics. It's just you change the magnetic field and then the, it creates a current. And then if there's no friction to that current, then there's no loss of energy um, from the cavity. And instead you amplify it on the outside with some power supply. So the squid detectors was a major breakthrough that allowed for the extreme sensitivity to very, very tiny energies that are deposited. So that's that's what's going on here. Uh, let's see, so there's a bunch of things. I wanted to see an actual image here. So let me see if I can find an image of ADMX, the actual cavity itself, the interior of the cavity. Here's what it looks like um, from a distance. This is worth looking at. Okay, so here's the magnet down here. Here is the cavity itself. It's deep inside this doer. Um, so that's to keep it shielded from outside electromagnetic radiation. So all of these, these field cancellation coils, that's to get rid of signals from radio towers and to get rid of signals from the electricity pumping through the, through the environment. 
Uh, you want to isolate your cavity from everything except for the axions. Uh, the pipe that you see running right here, that's the tuning rod. Um, it has this refrigeration system. They're pulling the signal out, comes out the top. Um, here's the squid amplifier. So they have all of these um, enclosures to keep ambient electromagnetic fields, like people's cell phones and stuff like that, out of the cavity. Don't want any of that to happen. All right, so the cavity's down here. It's about a meter tall, half a meter wide. There's a tuning rod right there, and this is what the size look like. They do, I believe, have a picture of the interior of this cavity, but it might not be readily available or readily visible. So this is, uh, I think that's Leslie Rosenberg. Um, is that, is that Gray Ribka? I think, I think that's who that is. I can't, uh, anyways, those are the main people working on it. Um, and it's not showing up. I'm not seeing a, a picture of the interior. So you're going to have to trust me that it has an interior that looks like that. It's really super shiny, the interior is. But that's why uh, they built this experiment, is to look for these dark matters. Um, yeah, so that, that squid amplifier um, is one of the key components that allows them to detect signals that are so small. I mean, these energies are so incredibly tiny that it's uh, they're very, very tiny energies. Okay, now... They run and they have to scan very, very slowly. Um, remember that their quality factor is, I don't know exactly what their quality factor is, but it's going to be something on the order of like a million or you know maybe a hundred thousand, something like that. Let's say that it's uh, let's say that it's a million just for the sake of argument. So their quality factor is a million, which means that their frequency resolution like this is really small, like one over a million. Okay, so if you want if they want to scan um, through, you know, say they're at one at like one micro EV, and they want to scan up to two micro EV, then they have to run this experiment a million times to get all these different Lorentzians is what the shape of this is, all these different peaks so that they overlap each other and span. You don't want to miss anything because if you miss where the axion mass is, you're not going to detect it. Like you're not going to go back through this again. So every little um, adjustment needs to be incremental so that these sensitivity regions overlap um, with successive uh, measurements. And so if you want to go from one micro EV to two micro EV, you have to do a million samples if the width of your thing is a million. And so you have this tiny little thing that you're walking across in frequency space, looking for axions at every interval. And their integration time is something on the order of a minute, like I think it's 90 seconds. Um, but anyways, that's a million minutes to go a factor of two in mass. And then you have another million minutes to go from two to three, and then another million minutes to go from three to four. And if you want to go 20, then you're looking at a decade. Um, if you want to go from one micro EV to 20 micro EV, then you're looking at a decade to, to make those measurements. So anything that they can do to speed it up is, is useful. One of the ways they can speed it up is to just build a new cavity that's smaller um, so that they're looking at 10 micro, micro uh, EV, and then they'll have a similarly narrow thing, but it's going basically 10 times bigger with each step. All these tests are automated. Uh, this is all run by a computer. They say go, and then it takes its measurement, and then it moves, and then it takes its measurement, and then it moves, and then it takes its measurement, and it runs basically constantly when the magnet is turned on. So as long as they get electricity, then they run the experiment. Um, when they see, here's the thing though. If they see a signal, the amazing thing is if they see a signal, then immediately the axion becomes the most precisely measured subatomic particle that we have. Um, so if they see a signal, it's because the mass of the axion lands right inside this, hold on, that's right inside this very, very narrow window. Oh, that was not quite as pretty as I was hoping it was going to be. Let's try this. Uh, it's just as ugly as the last one, so I'll, I'll make it taller this way. Um, so if they actually see something, it's because the axion mass is right here. Oh, I missed. Uh, it's because the axion mass is Come on, you can do it, you can do it. Yeah, right there, right there. So that is the mass of the axion that they would measure. If they see a signal, then they've measured the mass of the axion to like one part per million. So automatically, as soon as they see it, they know the mass of the axion to six decimal places. Um, that's because of the fact that they're looking in very narrow frequency range. If they see it, then that's where it is. Not only that, but they're so sensitive to the axion that let's suppose that the dark matter halo of the galaxy. So let's suppose we're looking at the dark matter halo of the galaxy. Here's the galaxy, like here's the main part of the galaxy. Here's the dark matter halo. Let's suppose that there are clumps in it or that there are sheets uh, and there are good reasons to expect that there might be 
like the axions are flowing in sheets. Um, so you have these axion uh, structures that form because the, the axion comes in, it's going to kind of slosh around a little bit. It's very, very, very cold, so there isn't a lot of random motion, and instead it's streaming motion. Um, and so the, the dark matter halo is actually not going to be some uniform cloud, but is instead going to have this interesting structure. And as a consequence to that interesting structure, if they detect the axion, they can actually map out some of the structure of the dark matter halo. They'd be able to do astronomy in the galaxy by like looking at diff slightly different energies of the axion, because in some cases, the axions will be flowing in this direction, the direction that the Earth is orbiting. In other cases, the axions might be flowing in a different direction, opposite the direction that the Earth is flowing. And that will cause a slight variation in the energy of the axions, and that will show up um, as here's different parts of the axion um, of the dark matter halo moving in different directions, like different clumps in the dark matter halo. So a, a brief uh, piece about this, like the axions are extremely cold. The way that they're produced in the early universe makes them so that they have very, very little random motion. Their motion is basically bulk uniform motion as they, as they drift through the galaxy. They don't have a lot of randomness to it. And as a consequence to that, let me pull out a piece of paper for this amazing demonstration. In fact, I'm even going to switch so that I can be um, right in front of everybody to see this amazing demonstration. Now get ready for this amazing demonstration because it's amazing. So here is, here is the equation. Here's the problem that the graduate students are going to have on their qualifying exam. <laughs> All right. Now, because the motion of these particles is very constrained, it's as though in phase space they're living on a sheet. Okay, so they don't have a lot of random motion. Random motion would be uh, coming off the sheet in the vertical direction. Instead, their motion is constrained to, um, to have very little random motion and, in general, just motion um, where they're where they're moving in a in a bulk stream. Okay, so that's like this. Now you form a dark matter halo. So here is the axions kind of drifting through the universe, and they start to clump up and form a dark matter halo. And so it's going to fold itself in. And I know this is going to be amazing sound. Um, it's going to fold itself into a dark matter halo that looks like this. So here is your dark matter halo. And inside here, way deep inside here, that is where your galaxy is going to form. But your dark matter halo is made up like this. This might look like a solid um, dark matter halo, but it is not. This is actually a two-dimensional surface that has been crumpled up and wound up into something that resembles a dark matter halo. And so because axions are so cold, they're going to have similar velocity and spatial distribution um, that you get from something like this. So the dark matter halo from an axion is not a cloud. The dark matter halo from an axion is like a crumpled up piece of paper. Um, there is some cloudiness to it because there's going to be some interactions that kind of stir things up. But for the most part, it's going to maintain some of these structures. And so as a consequence, when you make a measurement of the dark matter axions, you're actually measuring a crumple, like one of the folds in this manifold of the dark matter halo. And so you can map out like what is the overall structure of the galaxy in terms of the dark matter halo of the galaxy, because you can measure um, the different energies that correspond to different folds of the dark matter halo that's formed from axions. Now with WIMP dark matter, um, with supersymmetric dark matter particles and Kaluza Klein particles and stuff like that, they don't form this way. And as a consequence, they form puffy clouds where there's random motion. But axions are extremely cold and there's not much random motion. And so the dark matter halos that they form are more like this. It's It looks like a three dimensional object, but it's actually a lower dimensional manifold of things all crumpled and folded up like that. That is interesting. And that's one of the cool things about the ADMX experiment is if they see something, then they then we all of a sudden learn a whole lot, um, very quickly learn a whole lot. So let us take a look at what this ADMX experiment looks like, um, what the results look like. So if I go to new results, new new results from ADMX experiment. Uh, it, so there's a question about whether it would be likely, how likely is it for the axion, like for the detector to actually pass through one of these sheets. Now, these sheets aren't infinitesimally thin, right? The thickness of these sheets is going to be based upon the approximate temperature that the axions have, which is very small, but it's not zero. Um, and so you do have to worry about um, maybe we're in a void. Maybe we're in one of the gaps of the axion halo. Uh, maybe we're in one of the gaps, and so the Earth wouldn't be able to detect them. That is a concern, and it's a concern that... Um, is taken seriously by some and less seriously by others. The expectation is that for the most part there will be some ambient thing and so 
even if you get the wrong coupling, you might only be off by a factor of two. Maybe half the axions are in kind of a cloud and the other half is in these structures. Um, and so mm -hmm. if you measure a coupling that you, if you measure the axion, you might be missing the true coupling of the axion by a factor of two. You would be able to discern that by taking more data and then seeing like what, what the energy spectrum looks like in terms of fluctuations around the, the axion mass measurement that you make. Um, so you measure it at a given mass, and then there's going to be fluctuations because of the motion of the Earth and the motion of the axions in the halo. Um, and so you'd be able to kind of map out that behavior once you know where to look. Right now, the problem is we don't know where to look, and so you have to slowly scan through parameter space and identify something. Okay, let's see if they have some recent results. Um, these are not these are not recent results. These are pictures of the experiment. Here we go. This is what. This is from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. I'm not sure what year this is, but we are going to steal this image and look at um, these results. Okay, this looks pretty recent because ADMX HF is only a recent um, is only a recent experiment. So here's ADMX published limits right here. Uh, here's the white dwarf and supernova bounds. So those are the things that we talked about where uh, the white dwarf should radiate away axions and therefore cool faster, and so that puts limits on things. And so they have different, um, they have ADMX low frequency, so that would be a bigger cavity. They have regular ADMX here, so that's going to be, so that's the published limits. You can see that they're getting down to where you have axion cold dark matter and where you have um, the QCD axion. So this is QCD axions is in this band. And so they're getting down here and they're sensitive to it. They didn't push all the way through because if they push all the way through, that requires 10 times the integration time, which means it would take them a century to get that far instead of a decade. Um, so, you know, the integration time is an issue that they need to be concerned about. So anyways, here's ADMX. Here's modifications that they're making to the cavity. This is ADMX high frequency. So here they're going from, you know, this many electron volts to something that is 10 times bigger, uh, 10 times more energy, 10 times more mass, which means that the cavity needs to be 10 times smaller. So they're talking about small cavities like 10 centimeters instead of, instead of a full meter. So you have a bunch of 10 centimeter cavities. You have to have you want to have a large detector volume, and so you have to have more cavities in order to do it. Um, and then to get even smaller than that, then you're talking about centimeter size cavities if you want to go another factor of 10 and do it rapidly. You need to have smaller cavities to get the smaller wavelengths to fit into it. So the low frequency would be a bigger cavity. And then this thing on the side here, it says too much dark matter. That's because if, you f if the dark matter, or if the axions have these properties, then you produce too much dark matter and we're all, we're dead before we're even born, right? The universe already collapses on itself and gets to that point. So that is the ADMX experiment. Um, it, that shows you kind of what their current limits are. Um, let me see if there's anything more recent. Uh, if we look at the broad um, constraints on axions, then, okay, here's the PV loss experiment that we talked about last time, the laser experiments that I was part of, these, um, the cast experiment, which we're not gonna have time to go through today, so we'll postpone the cast experiment until either next time or sometime soon. Um, the horizontal branch stars and the white dwarf stars, and then these are the microwave cavity experiments, right? So this is what they're looking at. And the axion window down here, that is, the axion window is the allowed mass range for axions that are, are the cold dark matter. So you could, in this range, you could have enough axions produced in the early universe to account for the dark matter that we observe um, in galaxy rotation curves and et cetera and so forth. That is the ADMX experiment. And it is the cutting edge experiment in this. They've been expanding on it. Fermilab has gotten involved in some uh, related searches like the high frequency stuff. Um, and there's some new technologies that are being brought to bear, but this is the this one goes back about 20 years now that they've been operating this experiment because it's, it's a slow slog to, to go one frequency at a time. Um, but there you go. That is uh, looking for axion dark matter. All right. Does anybody have any questions? Um, so that's good. Uh, I haven't talked about the Peche Quinn symmetry. That's going to be an interesting discussion. Um, how realistic is an axion communication apparatus? Well, it's not realistic at all if there's no axion. So we'd have to discover them first and then decide where to go from there. Um, so this is Peche. He's at UCLA. Um, he's emeritus, I think, at this point. Um, and here's the, like I mentioned earlier with the neutron electric dipole moment thing, that um, the measurements of the neutron electric dipole moment are constraining the properties of the axion, uh, for uh, the constraining the properties of strong CP, the CP violation in the strong nuclear force. 
Um, it basically says we're down here and we would expect things to be up there and that's a problem. So that's kind of interesting. Um, here's the axion models that we talked about. Those are the different kinds of constraints that you can place on it. These are the different results. This is RFB, so that's the RBF, probably Rochester, Brookhaven, Florida, I think is probably what that is. Um, and then ADMX. Um, here's Pierre Sakivi from Florida. He's talking about like the axions and how you would detect these axions um, using these resonant cavities process here's them lowering that down into the hole okay here's the inside of the cavity so that's the, this is the high frequency ADMX experiment right because you can see the person's hand underneath it so that's what the inside of the cavity looks like this right here is a tuning rod you twist this you twist that thing and it will move the rod around inside this cavity and will adjust the frequencies that you're sensitive to so here's the high mass cavity and here's the main cavity so they're embedded in in this case it looks like they're coupling them together so they're in the same magnetic field then you don't have to have two different magnets and then this one's looking for high mass axions and this one's looking for low mass axions so that's kind of a cool idea and the, the high mass axion or the low mass axion the bigger container would look basically the same as this except um it would be uh bigger like it have the same kind of tuning rod now the surface features of these cavities you have to match up the surface features of the cavities um, because if you want to have a high frequency or a high quality cavity, it, you can only have so many surface imperfections. If you want to make a cavity that's the same quality, but 10 times smaller, then the surface imperfections have to be 10 times smaller. So that's a constraint to be watching out for. Uh, anyways, let's see what else that he's got in this thing. Um, this is what a signal would look like as they scan. They would see something that looks like that. That would be it. So that's a synthetic signal that they just injected into the system. Um, and you, as you scan, you look for a pile up like this and that says, there's the axion. So that's pretty cool. And then here is the constraints that they're able to put um, <clears throat> on it. And as they improve their, you know, as they scan and they improve their uh, sensitivity. So this is the difference in sensitivity between like a Maxwell Boltzmann distribution and an n-body distribution. So this is assuming that the axions have very low velocity dispersion. And so you get different coupling strengths basically to that. Um, so that's all stuff that we talked about. Here's preliminary, oh, cool. So their recent results, this is 2017, 2018, their preliminary results um, actually have them spanning that range. And they have the two different uh, constraints here. Um, to, I should include this in the, in the thing. They have these constraints here. That's the recent results. Okay, so there we go. This time for sure. Um, I appreciate everybody's time. I hope that you found this worth your while.